Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. What's up, guys? It's Darren. Welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. I hope you're having an awesome summer uh, wherever you are in the world. I did. I took a couple weeks off from recording the podcast, so apologies for that, but uh, I'm back. We're back and expect a lot more Touch MBA podcast episodes down the road. What we do on the show is you know, talk to admissions directors, talk to students, from top business schools around the world to, to really go behind the scenes and uh, learn what makes each MBA program tick, what makes them different. And of course, you know, uh, I try to draw out any lessons you can use uh, in your applications to give yourself a better chance of getting in these schools. Uh, I also bring on admissions consultants, uh, authors of admissions books to give their advice. And I also record some solo episodes. Uh, I used to be a MBA admissions director myself. I've seen you know a ton of applications and I've helped a lot of clients get into uh, top schools around the world. So this is going to be another solo episode. And it's focused on one of my new favorite books called Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit. So I think that's the first time I've cursed on the Touch MBA podcast. I hope those of you with kids will forgive me. But uh, the premise of this book and this episode is that we're all bombarded with so much information, things clamoring for our attention, and reading takes time and effort. So if no one wants to read your, your shit, what do you need to do to, to really stand out? And uh, this book was written by Stephen Pressfield, who's the author of 16 books, including The Legend of Bagger Vance, uh, which I believe was turned into a movie starring Will Smith, as well as four to five other books on how to write. So he's written extensively. You know, I love reading books. Uh, I try to read outside the MBA industry to get fresh ideas, but I haven't done a podcast based on a book since episode 51, and that was... That episode was called Stalking the Story, and that book was written by two-time Pulitzer Prize winner for dramatic nonfiction, John Franklin. That podcast and that write-up was focused on helping you identify four core elements of great stories. And uh, so be sure to check out that episode, which I'll link to in the show notes. But back on on this book, no one wants to read your your shit. I'm going to stop saying shit because uh, I just feel uncomfortable doing it. So I'm going to say no one wants to read your stuff, okay? (laughs) But uh, go ahead, uh, do yourself a favor and buy this book. It takes like one hour to read. It's a super easy read to soak in. But for this podcast, I'm going to take three concepts uh, from this book. There's many more, but I'm going to take three concepts from this book that you can immediately apply to your MBA story, to your MBA application. Um, And I realized when I was preparing this podcast that I'd been using these principles to help my my consulting clients find their best stories. Um, I didn't quite call them the same things, but I'd definitely been using these principles. So I hope these really help you overcome that attention barrier and that boredom barrier that so many readers and audiences feel these days with so much information. Yes, including your admissions reader, right? Imagine if you have to read thousands of essays. That's a lot of essays, right? So how can you really stand out? Before we jump into these three tips, I just want to make a couple quick announcements about uh, free services that I think many of you could could potentially benefit from at our site, uh, touchmba.com. So the first is that we offer free school selection help. You just need to go to our site, touchmba.com, submit your resume, uh, let us know your target schools and your career goals, and we'd be happy to guide you uh, along the way there, offer you some free expert guidance, Second, if you go to touchmba.com slash events, we send out these free monthly notifications 
telling you, you know, which top MBA programs are in town. So whether you're in Los Angeles or Singapore or London, we'll let you know which top 30 programs are, are in town and, and recruiting. So this way you never miss a chance to meet, you know, admissions staff from these top business schools and students and alumni that they usually bring to these events as well. Okay. Third, um, if you want to really get a better idea of what programs are really like and you want to have an honest conversation with, with students at top programs, go head over to ambassadors.touchmba.com. We have over 30 schools represented there by recent alumni or students. You can ask them, you know, your, your, your questions about what the experience is really like. They are the true authorities of the schools. So, yeah, we wanted to provide an avenue for you to, to reach out to them. Also, I wanted to give a shout out to our sponsor. When three MBAs struggled with student loans, they knew there had to be a better way. So they created one. Now Common Bond is a leading student lender, saving members up to $13,000 on MBA loans. Learn more at commonbond.co slash touch MBA. It's Common Bond Lending LLC and MLS number 1175900. All right. So no one wants to read your stuff. Uh, no one really wants to read anything. It isn't that people are mean or cruel. They're just busy. Whether it's your play, your advertisement, your movie, your book, or your MBA application, right? So let's start with tip number one. Every great story has to have a concept, okay? And by concept, I mean a unique twist, slant, or framing device that makes us look at this story from a specific point of view. In terms of the MBA application, what, what does this mean? Well, this is really a framing challenge. What do you focus your camera lens on? Let me give you an example. Uh, Christopher Nolan, one of my favorite film directors, recently uh, directed a movie called Dunkirk. And Dunkirk occurred during World War II when uh, over 300,000 troops were rescued by ordinary English mariners, right, who sailed across the English Channel and picked up these soldiers who were stranded on the beach in Dunkirk, France. And wow, what, a, what an amazing historical event uh, for so many reasons. We won't get into those. But what I want to focus on here is how would you tell that story? Would you tell it from the perspective of you know, mil military commanders, politicians, what they're trying to do? Would you tell it from the perspective of one family? What Christopher Nolan decided to do, his concept was to focus on land, sea, and air, right? He'd focus on a few soldiers on the land, a few sailors on the sea, and, and a few pilots in the air to tell this story. That was his framing device, okay? In MBA applications, the most concrete example of this is during interviews. When your interviewer is asking you, oh, please walk me through your CV or tell me about, you know, your work experience. Uh, can you quickly catch me up on what you've been doing? And a common mistake many applicants make is they kind of recite their CV. They say, okay, I went to college X. After college X, I started job one. In job one, I did A, B, and C. Then I moved to job two. And in job two, I did A, B, and C. Then I moved to job three, and in job three, I did A, B, and C. This is a ter terribly boring for your interviewer, right, to listen to because there's no, there's no story. There's no framing of your experience, right? Each of us goes through so much in life. We're so diverse and dynamic, and we experience so much in life. But when you're telling a story, you can only focus on so much, right, to keep the audience's attention and to be convincing. So what I advise, you know, my clients in these in interview prep is tell your CV like, like it's a story, right? Tell it like a book that it has chapters. So tell the interviewer why you moved from job one to job two, you know, what was the most amazing thing you did there and how did that lead you to job three and what you did in job three and how that leads you to say applying uh, for your MBA right? There's a coherence to that story. There's a framing. Uh, other people, it depends on who you're talking to, right? How you frame 
your CV? Are you framing it from the perspective of you're a marketing specialist? Are you framing it and telling it from a perspective of you always build new things? You always work on teams uh, that are in new spaces, right? So again, your application needs a concept. It needs a framing. What are you choosing to focus your camera lens on? In the movie making industry, uh, they always talk about, can your narrative idea be communicated in 10 seconds or less? And as soon as someone hears this idea, can you imagine all the cool scenes? This concept helps bring the core of your application to the, to the forefront, right? It makes your material more irresistible, more unforgettable, and it makes the ordinary and, and much used material, it makes that more fresh. It's all about how you frame your story. So that's tip number one. And don't worry, uh, we'll make this even more practical. At the end of the episode, I'll go through three applicants and show you how they used uh, these, these three tools. Okay. The second big tool is theme. Okay. So while concept, our first tool is more external and is what frames the material and what makes us look at your candidacy from a specific point of view, theme is what remains when you strip away all these elements of plot, character, dialogue. Just to quote uh, Stephen Pressfield, the author of the book, every work must be about something. It must have a theme. So what you want to do here is streamline your message and focus it and pare it down to its simplest, clearest, and easiest to understand form, right? Every character must represent something greater than himself or herself. The protagonist must embody a theme. And everything that's not on theme should be cut out. This theme is kind of the single idea that holds the work together and makes it cohere. And this is something I've really tried to encourage applicants to do in their applications is to make their application about more than themselves, right? Of course, you guys are all pursuing MBAs because you want to improve your career prospects. You want to make more money. You want to build up your professional network. You want to learn business, right? These these are obvious things that you know every MBA applicant wants. But can you make your MBA application tell a story greater than yourself? Can you incorporate themes that are universal that are universal and more likely to resonate with your reader? And again, I will delve into that with some real real life examples, okay? Finally, the last tip I want to give you from this book is structure or what uh, Pressfield calls the hook, the build, and the payoff. Just about all stories have three acts. Okay, Act one is the hook, which is the beginning that grabs the listener. Act two is when you're building tension and complication. It's the middle part of the story that escalates the tension, suspense, stakes, and excitement. And act three is the payoff. It's the ending that brings everything home with a bang. Well, let's talk about these three acts. Act one, the hook, that beginning that grabs the listener, usually has an inciting incident with the climax embedded. In MBA applications, that's usually like an anecdote. You're setting a scene in your application. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll get to real life examples of that soon. But in this act one, the hero starts in the ordinary world and receives a call for adventure, usually rejects the call, but meets a mentor who gives the hero the courage to accept the call. And then in act two, that's when you want to have, quote unquote, bodies hit the floor, right? You want higher stakes and jeopardy. This is when the hero encounters enemies and allies. He undergoes an ordeal that serves as an act of initiation, and he confronts the villain in his life, whether that's internal or external. And then in Act 3, there's a climax, which resolves the conflict of the narrative in terms of the theme and shows how the hero has returned home with this treasure that he's reintegrating into the ordinary world, but now is a changed person, thanks to his ordeal and experiences on his journey. You want to keep your story as primal as possible and tell it in scenes and in pictures. And so let me use three real life examples here to illustrate these three big tips in terms of concept, theme, and, and structure. The first applicant is now uh, attending LBS, and I've used her on other podcast episodes, but basically she was a doctor who wanted to build 
uh, and, and manage outpatient clinics in developing Asia to help people with chronic, uh, chronic diseases. Her, her concept was to focus on her struggle becoming a doctor and becoming, you know, a good doctor despite having a horrible uh, like autoimmune disease of lupus and then having rheumatoid arthritis and all these sort of problems, right, that she had to get through. Low energy, you know, her body opposing her. So that was her concept. Was, and what she specifically did was focus on her passing her medical exams and, and studying for them despite having basically no energy and despite, as she said, you know, seeing her fingers turn crooked. So that was her concept. Her theme really was about perseverance, was about, you know, if there's a will, there's a way, right? That, that was really the, the, the core, deep underlying theme of, of her story. And in terms of what was her hook, what was her build, what was her payoff, her hook was, why does a doctor want an MBA? There's very few doctors applying to get MBAs. So she already kind of had an interesting angle just by her, her, her background, right? So she stuck with that. What was her build? Her build was focusing on her struggle to study, to, to, to get her degree despite friends telling her she should rest, despite having professors telling her she should take a break. She was still able to overcome these huge uh, personal health issues and get her MD and, and serve the public working for the National Health Service, you know, in the UK. So that was the, her build, like struggling to get through her personal health issues. And her payoff was that she emerged right from this struggle with her degree and, and more willing now to help others uh, overcome these chronic diseases that plague so many people. Um, I hope that's clear. Let's take another example. This applicant uh, was an investment banker. She is now at INSEAD and she's Japanese. Okay. Her career goal was to move from investment banking to private equity or to do business development for a Japanese multinational corporation. Okay. Her, her theme or her concept, see, these are also interrelated. So it's tough to break them down one by one. But I would say that her theme was dealing with being an outsider, right? This applicant had moved to the U.S. as a young girl. She had moved back to Japan to pursue a university. And then she had moved to Singapore to work in investment banking, right? And she was one of the very few Japanese employees at her investment bank working with non-Japanese clients. Her theme was about dealing with being an outsider, okay? Her concept what she really focused on was her stories of cultural misunderstanding and, and issues. When she first moved to the U.S. as a young girl, what she had to deal with then, not being able to speak English and trying to fit in. Then she talked about moving back to Japan as a teenager and, and, and being a student and also feeling this profound sense of culture shock that she was so different than her classmates. And then when she was looking for a job, being an outsider in that her very traditional Japanese family wanted to, her to pursue a job in Japan, wanted her to pursue a job with the Japanese company, which was much more traditional, much more safe, much more expected, but how she kind of bucked that calling and went her own way and decided to work first for a multinational in Japan and then uh, to move to Singapore away from her family to work for you know a big investment bank there. So... That was kind of her concept, was focusing on these moments, these scenes of conflict between you know, her being an outsider in, in whatever situation she was in. Her hook uh, was that she's one of the few Japanese nationals working for an investment bank, bank in Singapore. Her build, again, was her struggle with being an outsider, challenging family norms, and the payoff was about embracing who she is, embracing her experience, and in the end realizing that she wants to give back to Japan. She wants to help Japan grow, help Japanese companies, and kind of restore the standing and might of the Japanese um, economy. And in doing so, also kind of make her family proud. So she went through this, this whole arc of going her own way and resisting 
you know, what her parents told her to do, what Japanese society told her to do. But now she's back trying to help those, those groups. So kind of a, a very nice story uh, told through her essays, her INSEAD essays. And of course, you know, the, the context of that was INSEAD's looking for people who embrace diversity. INSEAD's looking for, you know, very international applicants. So what a great way to, to get that message across too without pounding the reader on the head, right? Uh, saying, oh, I'm a very international person. By telling these stories, uh, the proof is already there. So let me share one more example. This example is of an engineer from Singapore and who is now attending SMU, which is one of the top uh, business schools in Singapore. His career goal was to do project management in the energy or, or tech industry. And his background, if I remember correctly, he was an electrical engineer and he was working at sort of these wafer manufacturing plants, right, for one of the big companies there. So what was his theme? His theme was about fully reaching his potential, right, which is something we can all relate to. Uh, what was the concept? What did he focus on? What he really focused on was his love of tinkering with things, like how he's the, this, this consummate engineer, how he loves taking things apart and building them, putting them together, whether that's uh, watches, computers, bikes, and now in his current job, these you know, huge 20 to $40 million uh, chip making uh, equipments, right? And his concept was that's what he loves to do and he wants to take that same mindset and apply it to business because he realized that even though he was so good at building things, fixing things, troubleshooting things, he wasn't able to often convince the clients to, to, to do so, to take the right steps. He realized he needed a lot more skills to do that. What was his hook? He started off one of his essays talking about, have you ever tried to repair a digital watch? I used to, right? And he goes on to talk about how he would you know, break apart watches and his parents would just like scold him and punish him. Like, what the hell are you doing, right? You're basically breaking this new watch uh, that we bought you. And so that's kind of like his hook into the story of how he's always tinkered with things, whether it's computers, with bikes, he builds his own bikes uh, that he uses on these like cross-country treks around Singapore. His build is how he's done this his whole life, how he's even gotten scolded for it, right? And now he's working with these insanely expensive machines and, and, and um, doing a great job with them. You know, I think he could have made his story better, like created more tension. You know, maybe in this episode with his client, he can show how he was really unable and ineffective in, in getting this client to, in persuading this client to take a course of action, right? And maybe this, because of this, there were some serious repercussions, right? If he raised the stakes there, if he dropped another body on the floor, you're bringing the audience along, you're bringing the reader along. And of course, during all these things, you want to be truthful, but you're, you're finding the best, most impactful, most dramatic scenes, right, to share with, with your reader. So I think this applicant could have made that second uh, part of his story, the build stage, more dramatic, increase the tension there. The payoff for this applicant was that he needs this MBA from SMU to reach the next level. He's this outstanding technician who wants to be a project manager. And to do that, he's going to need to understand business, right? Uh, which is a very common story that engineers tell. But what do you focus on to really draw out that theme of reaching your full potential, right? What are you focusing your lens on and what stories are you telling to really keep the reader's attention and to be memorable. That's what this is all about. A one side note to this all is Pressfield writes that a story is experienced by the reader on the level of soul. And the soul has a universal structure of narrative receptors. Uh, and that there's this collective unconscious, right? And that by tapping into theme, concept, and specifically the structure of hook, build, and payoff, and the hero's journey, which might be another podcast we do, but that by tapping into the, this sort of unconscious structure that has been with us for so long, that's how you get a story to really resonate with someone. And if your story isn't told with this structure, sometimes it's harder to get your point across. Um, similarly, I think cultures have their own stories that they tell 
themselves. And this is also very interesting, right? Because, for example, I'm American and we have this idea of the American dream in our society that if you work hard and do everything it takes, you can be whatever you want to be. That there's this idea of, of justice in, in our society that you will be rewarded if you work hard, if you put in the work, and if you commit to something, you can do it. There's this sort of optimism in our society. When you're applying to U.S. business schools, I do think applicants should be aware of this, right? And what I mean specifically is to never be a passive actor in your story. Because this, th th that goes against everything we believe in as Americans, right? You don't want to make excuses. For example, you don't want to say, in my current job, you know, I was looking for ways to advance. I was looking for ways to show off my marketing skills, but my superiors didn't give me any chances to do that. So what if your superior didn't give you any opportunities? Well, make them yourself. So you never want to be a passive actor in, in your story to, to U.S. business schools. Uh, this is just something I was thinking about when I was preparing this episode. Um, so in closing, I want to read a passage from Stephen Pressfield's book. When you understand that nobody wants to read your shit, your mind becomes powerfully concentrated. You begin to understand that writing and reading is above all a transaction. The reader donates his time and attention, which are supremely valuable commodities. In return, you, the writer, must give him something worthy of his gift to you. When you understand that nobody wants to read your shit, you develop empathy. You acquire the skill that is indispensable to all artists and entrepreneurs. The ability to switch back and forth in your imagination from your own point of view as a writer, painter, or seller to the point of view of your reader, gallery goer, customer. You learn to ask yourself with every sentence and every phrase, is this interesting? Is it fun or challenging or inventive? Am I giving the reader enough? Is she bored? Is she following where I want to lead her? So I think that's a great summary of the book and this episode. And uh, I hope you got a lot out of it and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.